officially two o'clock, so I wanted to welcome you all to the Biology Department's meet and greet for 2020. This is something we do every year, but we're doing it virtually for the first time this year, so it's kind of a new experience. So thank you all for being our experimental subjects. Uh, first, I just want to get a sense for who's joining us today. So I've got a poll, and you guys can feel free to chime in. So we've got a great mix here of students and faculty, lots of brand new students to Nepal. Welcome. I'll also take this opportunity to warn you all that we are recording this meet and greet to make it um, available to students who couldn't come today. So if you feel more comfortable turning off your camera, um, you're welcome to do that. And thank you again to all the faculty who made some time on a beautiful Friday afternoon to join us. It looks like there's a lot of you here as well. I'll wait just a couple more minutes for people to join before getting into the introduction. Okay, so I've set it up today so that all of the speakers can share their own screens and are welcome to present when they're introduced. Um, I should introduce myself. My name is Carolyn Martino. I am chair of the seminar committee for the biology department and I have some wonderful colleagues, Rim Barkowskis and Megan Scrementi um, and Jamie Engel that help support that committee and uh, I'll be introducing you to them as well as a number of the research faculty today and then Reem is going to take over and introduce some of the other very critical members of our department, the teaching faculty, the graduate students, and some student organizations as well. Um, but before we launch into the individuals that make up the department, I also wanted to extend a very special welcome to the new Dean of our college, Stephanie Dance Barnes, who's taken some time out of her very busy schedule to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her background um, today. So I will start by handing the microphone off to her. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone's having a productive day. Um, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to uh, zoom in and um, engage with you um, uh, based on my new appointment in university. Um, I'm actually housed in biological sciences. And so I'm very excited about um, having the opportunity to work and um, learn about uh, 
the various areas of research and interest with throughout the department. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, my uh, research interest is in cancer biology. Um, for several years, I did a, a lot of work with lung cancer. Um, and then I shifted more towards breast cancer, uh, particularly looking at targeted therapies. Um, uh, and by uh, also utilizing bioinformatics. Um, over the past several years, I've kind of shifted my research interests a bit more where I've gotten involved a lot with STEM education and how we're incorporating culturally re relevant um, teaching practices into curriculum, particularly for our K through 12 students to fuel the STEM pipeline. And so um, I've been um, uh, fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work with a lot of interdisciplinary teams. Um, currently, I am, well, I was the PI. I've shifted some of those responsibilities to another investigator on an NSF grant um, that deals with um, uh, uh, is uh, a NSF I test grant. And so we're focused on introducing third through fifth graders to culturally responsive pedagogy as it relates to um, STEM. And so um, it's been quite interesting in this particular time because we're working remotely. So we've actually had to change our curriculum quite, quite a bit for our students to make everything uh, workable online. And so it, it has been amazing to work with the research team that has the ability to adapt and adjust so quickly. But um, I'm, I'm honored to be here with you today. And um, I'm not sure if this is what you needed for me in regards to my interests. And so if you have additional questions, I'm very happy to continue the conversation one-on-one um, -on -one or in a small group. Um, but once again, thank you so much for inviting me here today. And I look forward once again to working with each and every one of you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Does anyone have any questions at the moment for Dr. Dance Barnes? OK. So I'll go ahead and start introducing the rest of the faculty in our department. Um, I did have one faculty member who needed to depart a little early, so we'll go a little bit out of alphabetical order. So first, I'd like to introduce Kenshu Shimada. And Kenshu, you can take over. How are you, everybody? So I'm glad to see many uh, freshmen are joined. Uh, maybe let me just quickly uh, show my screen here. Uh, all right. Can you guys see my screen or is it? Not yet. Not yet? Huh. Okay. Let's see. What is going on here? Screen share. Ah, it's not working. Well, it's all right. <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and talk. <laughs> so uh, I'm a, a vertebrate paleontologist uh, and a comparative anatomist. Uh, my special focus is on sharks. Uh, so anything that has to do with the ecology and evolution of sharks, that's what I do. Um, I, at the moment, all of my undergraduate students graduated <laughs> and one that I had transferred out, unfortunately. So I don't have any undergraduate students. So I am actually looking for uh, having new students. Uh, this COVID time is a bit challenging, but if you are, say, uh, freshman, uh, if you're in gym bio, I was suggested to try to get through the gym bio first, but then when sophomore, and hopefully by then uh, we will have an in person uh, you know, class sitting. Then, you know, uh, if you're interested in working with sharks or ecology and evolution, uh, please con feel free to contact me. So that's all I want to say. Caroline, oh, head, head back to you. Yeah. So next, Dr. Windsor Aguirre. Okay, can you hear me everyone? Good, okay, so let me see if I can uh, share my screen. Um, okay, so hopefully you're seeing a, a PowerPoint. Um, I am an associate professor of biological sciences. I've been here since 2009 and I'm an evolutionary biologist. 
Uh, so my lab is very interested in understanding how organisms diversify in nature um, and how they adapt to either naturally or um, human-induced um, changes, uh, cause changes in the environment. Uh, we work with uh, different approaches. So we're interested in the organisms, but we work with different approach approaches. So um, part of what we do is we um, uh, sequence DNA. We use different types of molecular markers uh, to understand um, population biology and evolutionary history. Uh, and then we also um, examine morphology. So we use a, a set of methods called geometric morphometrics uh, to understand uh, how form and shape vary among um, among the species that we study. Uh, most of my work now is, um, uh, field work is conducted in Northwestern South America in Ecuador. And then we also do some, some, some lab work uh, with um, 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 the, um, the Mexican Tetra, which we have a lab colony at, at DePaul. Um, I teach a number of classes. So um, right now I'm teaching um, evolution, uh, our sophomore level class, about 235 with laboratory. Uh, I'm also part of the general biology sequence, so I'm co-teaching uh, general biology two in the winter with Dr. LaMontagne. Uh, teach concepts in evolution. Um, course I haven't taught in a while is coming back um, next spring, hopefully. Margaret, hopefully. Uh, but that, that was on me. Um, I haven't uh, taught in a while. Uh, molecular methods in ecology and evolution. Um, and I've taught biostatistics and I have a new course called Evolution in Health and Medicine about how evolutionary history um, impacts um, uh, many of the diseases and uh, the maladies that uh, people have uh, experienced. Um, so someday, hopefully, we'll get back into something in the realm of normality. So I, I, uh, I also have a study abroad course uh, called um, Galapagos Evolution Society, which is co-taught with uh, Stan Cohn. Um, it hasn't, it was canceled this summer. Um, and um, it's not officially canceled for next summer, so we're not sure what's going to happen. But um, anyway, when it, when it gets back to normal, um, we, um, we have um, uh, this program that uh, is taught in the spring at DePaul, uh, two courses. And then um, we go to um, Ecuador on uh, mainland for a few days and then to Galapagos for a week um, to learn about um, the uh, theory of evolution by natural selection, its development, um, and, um, and its implications, broader implications for society. Um, so, and it's, this is a general program that's open for undergraduates from any college um, at DePaul. Uh, and then I thought I'd do a shameless plug. So um, uh, again, th this one has been canceled. So uh, last year um, I developed a, a new uh, focal point seminar study abroad course uh, called Biodiversity in the Modern Extinction Crisis. So this will be, uh, class, um, it'll be a 112 seminar uh, that's um, for freshmen, uh, new students at DePaul. It'll be taught um, in the winter quarter, and then uh, we will go to Ecuador um, over the spring break for around 10 days and um, learn about the major challenges uh, that the planet is facing um, in terms of the um, extinction of uh, biodiversity. So we're going to survey uh, a bunch of different um, habitats in Ecuador, uh, from the ocean to the mountains to the rainforest. So again, this is open. This is a focal point seminar open to any student uh, at DePaul and any college, uh, but it is restricted for students in the first year program. So tell you, you have new students, new friends that are uh, going to be new to DePaul next year, please do tell them about this. Thank you. All right. Question for Windsor. Is it open to faculty? So I think I'd love to go. All right, um, next on the list is Dr. Margaret Bell. Okay, thumbs up, audio, visual, good, thank you. All right, hi everybody, it's great to see so many faces. I think this is better turnout than we normally get in person, so uh, three cheers for Zoom. Um, a little bit about my research and my trainings in neuroscience, but I have kind of dabbled and expanded, so now I'm interested in how the brain is influenced um, is as a whole person, right? In an environment that's complicated, but also as it interacts with other systems within your body. So um, I'm interested in how hormones that circulate through your body, so your endocrine system can influence how your brain works and um, how immune signals can also uh, kind of serve a similar purpose. So I'm at this intersection between neuro and immuno and endo. 
Um, and that's especially interesting because we're thinking about in a developing brain. Um, right now, so my, my big interest is how the environment affects brain development. Um, at the moment, the environmental question that we're asking is how exposure to an environmental contaminant. So uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, are a nasty environmental contaminant that's everywhere, um, unavoidable, but we're uh, trying to understand how it's potentially shifting population norms of different diseases. Um, it might be influencing how uh, inflammation is going on in your brain. So what that actually looks like, um, sometimes we're looking at brains. These are microglia within a brain. Um, sometimes we're at the bench, but sometimes we're snuggling cute baby rats um, and uh, asking them how they're feeling. We're putting them through different behavior tests to see um, if we can assay uh, what's going on in their brain, because they can't tell us. So we have to um, design questions where we can ask them um, experimentally. So that kind of dovetails with the classes that I teach. Um, it's kind of broad. My bedrocks in the bio department are cell biology and endocrinology. Um, teaching cell in the spring, hopefully we'll get to endo again next spring. Um, I also teach some bio 191 labs. Uh, so you might see me in lab sections. Um, if you know anybody who's not a bio major, I'm gonna teach um, brain and behavior in the winter and spring, so that'll be fun. Uh, I also am a joint appointment with health sciences. So I teach some classes for health. I teach um, health research literacy, which is essentially how to read a paper. Um, and then apply a lot of these concepts to humans in a, in a class called physiology of poverty. So what happens to a body when it lives in an, especially an unequal uh, environment? stressful, right? So um, we, we think about what's happening to a whole body, but I also focus on, on brain and think about um, stress hormone mechanisms there. Um, at the moment, there's a bunch of folks in the lab. Some of them are active, some of them are doing research papers. If you're interested, please, um, if I can answer any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, we might not be able to get you in the lab right away, but we can think about future. So also stay in touch. Um, and Please let me know if you have any questions. Good luck this quarter. Thanks, Dr. Martino. Thank you very much. Um, next on our list is Dr. Joanna Brooke. Hi, everyone. I'm not going to share my screen today, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. It's good to see everyone. I like the turnout. Uh, nice to see all the freshmen tuning in. So I am a microbiologist in the department, uh, been at DePaul since 2001, and I teach a number of courses, including microbiology, biotechnology, and medical bacteriology. I'm Canadian trained as a researcher, graduate student, and did a postdoctoral fellowship in UT Southwestern Medical Center before coming to DePaul. Um, my research interests are Pretty broad. I tend to focus on one particular infectious bacterium at the moment called Stenotrophomonas multophilia. This causes a wide variety of infections in humans. And I'm interested in looking at ways to defeat this pathogen, to stop it making what we call bacterial biofilms. Um, the organism itself is found widely in nature as well as inside and outside the hospital clinical setting. So one of the um, bad features of the organism is that it's multi-drug resistant. And so we have a number of different ways of trying to stop this organism from making these films and um, stopping the infections in patients. So I should mention that the most common infections by this organism are respiratory tract and bloodstream infections, and it can be fatal in those that are immunocompromised. So it's becoming one of those pathogens that's more and more noticed in the hospital setting. So it's essential that we look for ways to combat this pathogen. Um, right now, I've got um, two graduate students working with me on this project. Um, I'm experiencing some turnover in undergraduate research students. So I know the value of getting research experience in a lab. I come from that background myself. I remember my undergraduate research experiences. Uh, this is typically where you can find out if you really want to enter into the field. So I'm always looking for undergraduate students. Uh, I really would like them to have completed the freshman biology sequence first. Uh, you can always contact me ahead of time, but 
that really is uh, a requirement for getting into my lab. It is an infectious disease lab, and so there's some specialized training required before you can actually get to work on the lab bench. Uh, one of the things I really like about being at DePaul is it gives me a chance to interact with students, and I know the value of getting a good research experience. It is not just about doing the glassware and doing the cleanup of the lab. It's all about being participating in all of the steps of the research project. And so I've had a number of undergraduate students as co-authors on papers, and I've taken students to international and national conferences as a result of this. So I look forward to meeting some of you. So if you're interested in my area of research, please feel free to reach out to me. If you are health sciences oriented or biology oriented, both populations I'm very interested in. And if you are taking the traditional biology route or the traditional health sciences route, you may run into me as one of the three instructors of the microbiology course. And I think you'll see I'm a very passionate teacher as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Back to you, Dr. Martino. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, next is Dr. Jason Bistriansky. All right, hi everybody, how's it going? I'm gonna to try to share my screen too. Hopefully that works. Did that work? All right, so um, I'm an associate professor here at DePaul in biology. I've been here since 2010. And uh, my background, I've got a marine biology undergrad and a PhD in comparative physiology, which I'll explain what that is in a second, uh, both from the University of Guelph, which is uh, near Toronto in Ontario, Canada. Some of my teaching that I do that you may uh, come across me in your, your classes, I teach uh, the third intro bio with Dr. Dean in the springtime. So if you haven't yet taken gen bio number three, uh, there's about a 50-50 chance you'll see me there. Um, I also teach animal physiology, so our third year animal physiology. So if you're interested in physiology and like to learn about a variety of different animals and not just a more of a human-centric approach, uh, you're welcome to take animal physiology uh, bio 307. And then I also teach a upper level um, extension of animal physiology, which is called advanced comparative physiology, which essentially looks at how different animals are adapted to live in more extreme environments. So think about animals that can live through the winter by hibernating, or they can live at high altitudes, or they can survive long periods of time without water or food, that type of thing. So uh, if you're interested in cool animal adaptations from a physiological perspective, uh, keep that course in mind. And then finally, um, along with Dr. Kyle Grice in chemistry, uh, we developed a research-based study abroad program in, that goes to Spain every summer. And as Dr. Aguirre mentioned, that was a little bit more challenging to run study abroad last year, so we had to cancel it. But this year, we're still hoping that we're going to have a cohort going to Spain for our summer course. Essentially, this course is meant to give students a research experience. So if you um, try to get into a lab and you're just not successful or maybe um, time's ticking on your career and you haven't quite got the research experience you want, we developed this course to sort of give you the, the research experience within a, the spring quarter and then a following two week study abroad experience in Spain where students are um, asked or tasked with the idea of coming up with their own novel research project and then uh, playing it out in the field over a two week period. And believe it or not, we've actually had students uh, publish their, uh, their results from these, uh, these experiences before. So it's been really positive for a lot of our students and I'm really proud of that. So if you're interested in uh, getting some research experience by a different route through a course-based situation, please uh, let me know. My background and my research is in the field of what's called comparative physiology. Um, and what that means is I like to ask questions about how animals work by and try to answer them by comparing a variety of different species together. So some animals are good at certain things and other ones are bad. So what's the difference? Why is one animal able to do something that another animal can't? And my focus is mainly on how different animals can tolerate different levels of salt in their, their life. So you think about the last time you were at the ocean, if you got a big gulp of seawater, you probably weren't feeling too good about that. And that's because as humans, we're not very good at drinking seawater. But if you think about all the rest of the animals that live in the sea, that's their water, that's what they drink all the time. And so somehow they're able to tolerate huge amounts of salt load in their diet through drinking that 
most terrestrial animals could not survive doing. So I study how animals are able to deal with salt and water balance. And my main group of animals that I choose to work on are actually fishes because there's a whole variety of different fish groups that are capable of transitioning from fresh to salt water. So they go through some drastic uh, changes in salinity in their lifetime and they have to find a way to physiologically acclimate to those changing water salinities. And so I usually study salmonid species, so salmon, trout, or char, a bunch of, got a bunch of different fish in that family, because those fish typically have a juvenile phase that's uh, predominantly found in freshwater, and then they transition to a marine fish where they swim out to the ocean to take advantage of all of the food that's in the ocean before uh, returning back to uh, their native streams to spawn in freshwater. So salmon tend to be a great model species for me because I can ask questions about how they survive and how they are able to deal with very high salt flows in their, in their diet when they drink the seawater. So if you have questions about volunteering in my lab, please uh, email me. Um, it's a little bit of a strange time right now, obviously, with our situation, but I'm always open to new students that come along. And if you're interested in the study abroad option, please do email me. We usually have um, info sessions in the end of this quarter and the beginning of the winter quarter to help students learn a little bit more about the program and what to expect. Okay, thanks for coming and uh, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Martino. All right, so our next faculty member, you may have heard her name recently because she's been very sought after by local media outlets of late, uh, Dr. Sarah Connolly. Sarah, are you there? I am, I'm sorry, my sharing no, no, is a little rusty. Okay. <laughs> All right, but you can see it now, right? So I'm Sarah Connolly, I'm an associate professor. I've been at DePaul since 2012. Um, I have a joint appointment in health sciences and biology. So in bio, I teach um, intro bio 191 and microbiology. And then occasionally I teach a upper level molecular virology course that is, um, it counts towards a bio major as a, an elective. And then I teach a few courses in health sciences, health research literacy a while back, um, and then uh, human pathogens and defense. And um, I've taught a freshman seminar on Ebola viruses. Um, I study viruses, so I study herpes viruses. Uh, there are nine human herpes viruses, and most of us are infected with at least one. And once you're infected, you're infected for life. Um, I use herpes simplex virus as a model virus, um, but virus entry is really conserved, or, or aspects of it are conserved. So whatever we learn about herpes simplex virus entry is going to apply to the herpes, the other nine, the other eight human herpes viruses, um, and the same concerns about how viruses get into cells apply to other viruses, including like HIV, Ebola, and these days um, SARS-CoV-2, of course, is at the top of our minds. I study the um, fusion machinery. So I study the proteins on the surface of the virus that are responsible for binding to a host cell and causing the virus to actually enter that cell. So this is my only slide, uh, but I wanted to sort of give you a one slide to tell you about why viruses are um, fascinating. So they have a very small genome. Uh, some viruses could have as few as a dozen genes. Um, and that genome is protected by a protein coat. And then some viruses have a lipid uh, membrane around them called the envelope and other viruses don't. But that's all it takes. Just a little genome and a protein coat, maybe a lipid envelope, and the virus can take over the life of the host cell. It can um, impact or even kill the individual, as well as it can spread through populations. So um, that's why I find viruses to be so fascinating because they're so simple. Um, there are basically four steps to a virus infection. It starts with the virus entering the cell, then the genome replicates, the proteins get expressed, the virus is assembled, and then it exits the cell. The part that I study is that attachment and entry part. So there are proteins on the surface of the virus that are responsible for binding to the cell, <laughs> um, interacting with one another, and then causing the viral envelope to fuse with the host cell. And that's what I study, those proteins on the surface. So I do some um, protein biochemistry. I sort of look at protein structures and then try to understand the function of the structures. Um, and the reason why I like studying this part of the virus life cycle is that um, it's a good target for antiviral intervention. So one of our projects is looking at a small molecule that 
um, potentially could interfere with the function of these proteins on the surface of the virus uh, to pre prevent the virus from entering the cell. I'm on research leave this year, so I'm not teaching, um, but I don't want to train anyone right now until we can get back into the lab. Um, so I am interested in bringing in new students, um, but that's going to have to sort of wait until we have some more, um, uh, till that's safer. But if you're interested, feel free to send me an email and we can talk about it. And thanks. All right, thank you. And I noticed you're also repping our fabulous DePaul Blue Department of Biology oh, yeah. shirt. So <laughs> thank you for showing your DePaul colors today. All right, up next is Dr. John Dean. Hi folks, does everybody see this? I hope, good. I miss, I miss everyone, I miss human interaction. But uh, anyway, I'm glad everybody was able to attend. Um, I'll kind of do this real quick. Uh, I'm Dr. Dean, uh, I've been here since sometime in the 1980s. It's been so long, I can't remember the exact date actually. Um, but I've uh, been here a long time. Um, and I taught a variety of different courses. Right now, I'm uh, primarily teaching general biology. Uh, one, I'm teaching Bio 191 right now. Uh, as Dr. Bistriansky mentioned, I, I also teach Bio 193 with him. I teach the plant portion. Um, so I'm the plant guy, and Dr. Bistriansky is the animal guy. Uh, I also teach a couple of plant biology courses. Um, plant physiology is kind of a cross listed upper level um, graduate. Uh, undergraduate, uh, graduate level course. Uh, as far as my research, uh, I am uh, absolutely fascinated in plant uh, biochemistry. The, the amount of things that, that plants make uh, is astounding. Uh, we're primarily interested in some of the compounds that would be considered secondary compounds or natural products. A lot of these ends up, end up being um, useful as, as drugs or medicine. Uh, but almost all of them are synthesized and then they end up in a specialized organelle that's known as the, uh, the vacuole. So we study how the different compounds are metabolized and how they then get transported into the vacuole. And for a lot of years, we spent some time talking uh, or doing research on salicylic acid. Uh, it's the active ingredient in aspirin, but uh, we're not interested in its medicinal purposes. We're interested in the fact that it's a plant defense uh, compound uh, that ends up in the vacuole where it's uh, metabolized and stored. So we, a lot of this slide here is a lot of the information that we generated over the years in my lab, uh, how this compound is metabolized, some of the transporters that are involved and then moving it and storing it in the vacuole. A lot of our work involves the uh, model plant organism, Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is kind of the fruit fly of the of the plant world, uh, the genome is sequenced. There's a lot of uh, mutants available. A lot of the DNA clones are available that can simply be ordered up on catalogs. So it's a nice, it's a nice model organism to do some genetics on uh, molecular biology with. Um, over the past few years, we've shifted our focus um, and started to work on uh, flavonoids, uh, particularly anthocyanins. These are the red and purple and blue colors that you see in plant tissue. Uh, they, uh, so the, the purple color of grapes, uh, the red color of wine, um, blueberries, the red color of blueberries and the red of, of cherries, those are all anthocyanins. They are involved in uh, attracting pollinators. Uh, they're also uh, involved in attracting uh, seed dispersers. Uh, these are some of my rose bushes out here in my garden. You can see that the new growth also is red uh, with anthocyanins. They're there to protect the new growth from uh, UV radiation. Uh, we very recently kind of determined that uh, or identified a vacuole, a transporter that actually moves these things and store them in the vacuole. Uh, and we can have, and we've also identified a couple of mutants. Um, so here's the wild type, a rabidopsis that forms this nice deep red color because of the anthocyanins. And then we can identify them here. This is just a chromatogram showing the different anthocyanins. Uh, and then we've got a mutation that's simply a mutation in this transporter, and that really disrupts the type of anthocyanins that end up being made. Um, so we're, we're in the process of characterizing this transporter and uh, identifying a couple of others uh, that may be involved in this vacuole or transport. 
Um, so that's, uh, that's me, and that's kind of all I got. Back to Dr. Martino. Thank you very much. All right, up next is Dr. Bill Gilliland. There, I was muted. Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Bill Gilliland, and I am, uh, I've been here for about 10 years. And I, uh, I'm a geneticist by training. So I work on the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry, say again. Oh, uh, so let me show you a picture of my favorite organism. So this is, um, this is our fruit fly. The marks at the top are millimeters. So she's about uh, two and a half millimeters long. And this uh, white glob coming out of the posterior end is actually an egg. She's in the process of laying it when I knocked her out with carbon dioxide. And uh, this is a confocal um, microscope image of DNA. So this is a dye called DAPI. And this little black rectangle is the oocyte nucleus. So this is the actual chromosomes that are going through meiosis. And so if we blow this up, uh, the scale bar here is 100 microns. So this is about half a, uh, half a millimeter long. If you blow it up, you can actually see the individual chromosomes uh, in here. And so how these chromosomes move around during meiosis um, and what, they're what the genes are doing that uh, do this is uh, an important part of what I study. Now, um, what governs this movement of the chromosomes during uh, meiosis and Drosophila? And uh, in my lab, we do genetics, so we do cross and we count the progeny. So for instance, uh, when things go wrong, you get non-disjunction and you wind up with progeny that have the wrong number of chromosomes. And so you use markers on those chromosomes, uh, such as white eyes versus red eyes, and you can actually see that uh, taking place in the progeny of the cross. Uh, I'm also the director of DePaul's confocal microscope, um, which is a, uh, which is is a very powerful tool that about a third of the labs uh, make use of in their research and it allows us to take pictures like the ones they show you and I actually have a, a video and I'll put the the link to this in chat let me let me stop my sharing here for a second so um, the link to that is here and if you want to watch it I encourage you to turn on high definition because it's really really pretty uh, but I'll show you just uh, what I have going here uh, even though Zoom does lower the quality. So if you want to see this, I encourage you to go to YouTube and watch it in high definition. So first, this is a protein called actin. It's part of the cell skeleton. And you see these little rings. Those are ring canals. So there is incomplete mitosis taking place. And I'm going to, this is a video that I, uh, I recorded this summer at DePaul uh, on our confocal microscope. And so it shows you the... Uh, the actin as it goes around, and then it's going to show the same uh, same set of cells for the DNA. And you can see that the DNA is very flat. It's part of the way that this was prepared. And then it'll show again with those two molecules superimposed. So you have red for the actin and blue for the DNA. And the reason that I took this picture is that uh, a project my lab has been involved in for the last several years is a genetic screen where we're going through a large number of genes and knocking them out one by one in the germline. And normally, a, uh, a Drosophila egg, that's what that uh, picture was of, an egg chamber about the size of a human hair width, um, normally it will have 15 of those rings. But if you count them in that video, there's 31. So this gene, when you knock it out, causes one additional round of mitosis during egg development. And we're the first people to ever study this gene. We're the first people to ever find a phenotype for it. So we get to name it and we're calling it double fission with F-I-S-S-I-O-N instead of vision like double, like a uh, problem with your eyesight. Um, so that's a project that uh, the students in my lab and I uh, worked on where we identified this gene and we have a manuscript in preparation describing uh, the effects of this gene. Okay, so thank you very much. All right, thank you. Dr. Jing Jing Kip. All right, I just unmuted myself. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Kip. So I have uh, a few slides that I'd like to share with you. So nice to see everybody here. 
All right, I hope you can see my slides now. Let me, that's good, thanks. Let me put into this one. Okay, so uh, I'm a, a reproductive biologist and uh, currently associate professor at the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, I received my PhD degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, my PhD pro uh, education was focused on physiology. And the following that, I went to Northwestern, did my postdoctoral training, uh, where I studied uh, mostly ovary development, so reproductive biology. So after I joined DePaul, I have been offering a number of courses related to my expertise. Uh, so for example, here, uh, the top four that are listed here are some current courses that uh, uh, I offer now. So uh, first one is uh, how the human body works. This is a, a science inquiry course, uh, it's Bio 134. And another one uh, is a seminar-based course, it's a mammalian reproduction. Uh, I can see that uh, some of my students <laughs> from this course are currently uh, with us at the, this uh, Zoom meeting. It's very nice to see you guys. And uh, I also offer a, a human physiology course. Uh, this course was first uh, started last year, and the precursor for this course was a vertebrate physiology, which I taught for, I don't know, maybe nine years uh, at DePaul before we convert that into human physiology. And finally, I also teach a biology capstone seminar course. Um, so these are the courses uh, that I offer. Uh, in terms of research, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a reproductive biologist. And uh, in particular, uh, I would say my field is related to molecular endocrinology. So we're interested in studying hormone signaling and the gene regulation of uh, ovarian follicle development. So the reason we are interested in ovary development uh, is because uh, you know, understanding the mechanism behind this uh, uh, particular endocrine uh, organ in our body in terms of how it develops and uh, uh, maybe develop diseases, uh, that'll help us to understand uh, population control, infertility treatment, and also treatment and prevention of uh, some uh, critical human diseases, for example, ovarian cancer, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, premature ovarian failure. Uh, many of these diseases are affecting in a big, pop a big portion of the uh, population of our society. So we hope that by understanding the mechanism, we will find a better way to treat these uh, uh, different kind of diseases. And the current focus uh, in my lab, uh, we are uh, especially interested in the effect of vitamin A and the calcium signaling in regulating ovary development. So uh, vitamin A, when you take vitamin A, it's going to uh, be converted into an active form in our body, which is called a retinoic acid. Uh, originally, people thought that uh, retinoic acid would only affect male reproduction. And my lab was the first one who demonstrated that uh, retinoic acid and the genes that regulate its signal pathway uh, it is actually expressed in the ovary and especially important for the postnatal ovarian follicle development. Uh, so we published a paper in endocrinology uh, reporting this uh, uh, discovery. Uh, in terms of a method that we use for research, uh, we use a very a broad spectrum of uh, uh, approaches, including molecular, cellular, morphologically, and uh, also physiological um, methods. So we use animal models, and uh, the animal we use the most is uh, mice. And uh, uh, so our research is involved in animal treatment and the dissection. Oh, sorry, accidentally on the next slide. So my lab has, a, uh, let's see, five or six different lines of a transgenic animal, uh, transgenic mice. And we are actually in the process of making a new transgenic uh, mouse model uh, by breeding a, a flops mouse uh, line that we obtained from France uh, with uh, some other uh, 
three animal models uh, that we obtained from North Carolina and from UIC, uh, different uh, laboratories. So our goal is to, you know, breed these mice uh, and then so finally knock out a particular gene related to retinoid signaling in the ovary only, not anywhere else in the body, only in the ovary. So this, this is called a conditional knockout. Uh, so this research has been going well. I have one graduate student and one undergraduate student working on that project. Uh, in addition to animal models, we also use the cell culture and the tissue culture um, methods. And we do a lot of histological and morphological studies. And in my lab in particular, we, we are basically molecular biology uh, lab. So we do a lot of DNA, RNA, protein related studies. And uh, in recent years, we also started collaboration uh, with a, a faculty from uh, Rosalind Franklin. We used uh, live single cell imaging and uh, we have published paper on that uh, in that area as well. So uh, if you're interested, well, my lab is always actively uh, recruiting uh, students at different levels. Uh, if you're interested in joining my lab, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. All right, uh, thank you to exit my share and back to Dr. Martino. Thank you. All right, up next is Dr. Dorothy Kozlowski. My apologies. I'm Polish. I should know how to say that name. No problem. It's pretty phonemic. I don't know. A lot of people have trouble with it, but it sounds like it's spelled. Anyway, hi, everybody. I'm Dorothy Kozlowski, and let me go ahead and share my screen with you really quick. Okay. Can you all see that okay? All right, awesome. Um, so I, it's great to see you all. Thank you for coming today. Um, I am a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences uh, with a joint appointment in the neuroscience program. I am a neuroscientist. Um, my training is actually in psychology and um, I received my degrees from the University of Texas at Austin and did postdoctoral fellowships in neurosurgery and neurobiology at UCLA and at Northwestern. And all throughout that time, I've always been really just interested in trying to figure out how the brain fixes itself after it's been injured. Um, before I go on to my research, a little bit more about myself. I'm a Chicagoan. I've been at DePaul since uh, 2000, so it's my 20th year. And I'm also a first-generation college graduate. So if anyone um, ever wants to talk about that or would like to hear my experiences doing that, um, I'm a daughter of Polish immigrants who did not finish school. and so. Um, I know what it's like to, to be in those kinds of shoes, so feel free to reach out. Um, in terms of the courses I teach, oops, it doesn't want to advance, here we go. Um, currently, or not currently, this year I'll be teaching biostatistics in the winter, and for biology I'll also be teaching Introduction to Pharmacology, which is a class that we're slowly trying to um, make more regular again, um, and I'll be teaching that in the spring. And then additionally, uh, for the neuroscience program, I am going to be teaching the neuroscience capstone, as well as a, a seminar course um, that any student is welcome to take. You can use it as an open elective, where we're going to be reading um, articles and then having a faculty who wrote those articles come to the class and talk about their work and, and engage in, in seminar discussions. That's going to be more for juniors and seniors. Um, and then listed are all the other courses that I've taught over time. Um, in terms of research, um, my focus at DePaul has been looking at traumatic brain injury. I use an animal model. And as I said, I'm very interested in understanding how the brain tries to fix itself. Um, lots of different projects in my lab. I'm, I'm rebooting my lab after a short hiatus. Um, but the things that, that we study are why repeat concussions are bad. So our lab created a model, an animal model of a clinically a more clinically relevant animal model of traumatic brain injury of repeat concussions. And with that, we've been looking at sex differences in response to the brain injury. And that's what we've been doing in collaboration with Dr. Bell, also from biology and health sciences. Um, I collaborate with Dr. Kudovac in health sciences and together we explore whether there's a genetic risk factor for traumatic brain injury, looking at the APOE gene. Um, the APOE gene is, is a risk factor. If you have an APOE4, there's a risk factor for, for the development of neurodegenerative diseases. 
Um, and then something that's not biology related, but it's important to me is I've begun um, working on an effort to, uh, to bring more awareness to the link between traumatic brain injury and domestic violence. Um, this is work that I do in collaboration with Dr. Sonia Crabtree Nelson in the School of Social Work, and also uh, Kate Lawler, who's, at, who's the director of the Violence Prevention Program at Swedish. Um, when people think of traumatic brain injury, you immediately think of football player, but in reality, survivors of domestic violence, there's more of, of those individuals um, who have been affected from brain injury than NFL players. Um, that is more, not really research per se, but um, it is a, a form of scholarship. We're working to develop a program to provide more support for individuals, um, uh, uh, victims of, of violence. So that is me. Um, right now, I know a number of students have reached out to me. Um, I'm putting you all on hold for the moment until I prioritize and think about which of these pieces of, of research I'm going to be focusing on next. Um, but please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about my work or would like to um, talk about being first gen. All right, thanks everyone. I will right. stop sharing. Thank you very much for sharing your professional and personal story with us. Uh, next is Dr. LaMontagne, who if I didn't mistake this, looks like maybe dialing in from her regular Friday campsite. Yeah, this is a real tree. These are all real trees, it's not a background. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, um, so hopefully you can see that. Um, so yeah, I'm Dr. Jillian LaMontagne. I'm also part of our Canadian expat crew down here. So my bachelor's degree is in ecology. My master's is in conservation ecology. My PhD is in environmental biology and ecology. And, and with no surprise, I teach ecology. Um, and also in the Gen Bio sequence, Intro Bio 2 uh, with Dr. Aguirre. And I teach a research methods and applied biostatistics course as well. So our Biostatistics 206 is a prerequisite for this course. Uh, there's a, a computer-based lab in, in R, and, and my goal with this course is that students, after learning this, can like go off and, and analyze lots and lots of different data sets. Uh, and then I also teach population ecology. Um, as a, oop, there we go. As a population ecologist, I'm interested in patterns of populations and how they change over space and time. And one of the main systems that we work in is in reproductive patterns of trees. And so this picture on the left are, shows uh, white spruce cones um, that are new. And some years these trees and, and many other species of trees, oaks do this with acorns. Many years trees don't produce very many cones. And then some years they produce massive amounts. And so uh, for white spruce trees, that'll look like the picture here uh, on the right in the fall when the cones have opened up. It's just brown instead of green. Um, and so in my lab, we do a lot of field work. We spend a lot of time counting cones on trees. This year we counted cones on 1,600 trees um, for four different research projects in three different states in the U.S. Uh, we're interested in how these patterns synchronize over space and time. So uh, here, this picture of this computer, we have a temperature data logger set up on this tree to see those patterns. Um, and earlier this year, my lab published a, a paper where we looked at data across the continent of North America and discovered what we're referring to as an ecological dipole, where we have lots of sites where we have this mast event, which is where these trees are producing massive quantities of seed synchronously. And over here, there's no reproduction happening at all. And there's links uh, with that to, to climate patterns. Um, we also do some research on climate change. So for the last four summers, we've been going up into Northern Minnesota where the Oak Ridge National Laboratory has this really neat experiment where they have these huge chambers that they set up actually in the forest. So there's full size trees in there, two different species of conifers. Uh, and we go in and have been counting the, the cones on, on those trees. And, and this picture on, on the right down here, it says, welcome to a warmer future. And this is plus nine degrees Celsius above ambient with 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide added to, the, to that plot. Um, we've realized in some of our sites in Wisconsin that some of our trees have, have started to die. Um, and the, the, there's an insect that's responsible for this called spruce budworm. And so I've had students in the lab looking at, is this related to the different species of trees? Because some species of trees are dying and others aren't. We're looking at its relationship to reproductive patterns in the trees. 
Um, we've cored trees to look at uh, tree ring analysis for these. And overall, with all these questions about mass seeding and, and who cares about cones on trees and, and seeds on trees, well, seeds are really important for forest regeneration. And so we need to understand what's happening with these patterns of reproduction from individual trees up to the continent in order to be able to predict what's going to happen to our future forests. And those seeds also form the basis of the food chain for so many different species of animals. So this, uh, this bird here has a white spruce seed in its, in its mouth. And, and of course, it's not only birds, but also mammals that feed on, on these seeds. And so uh, with some colleagues at the University of Utah and at um, University of Wisconsin-Madison, we're linking these climate dipoles to not only plant populations, but then linking it to animal populations as well. Um, and just briefly, we also do urban ecology research in the lab. So I have an appointment as an adjunct scientist at the Urban Wildlife Institute at the Lincoln Park Zoo. And, and we've been looking at tree cavity availability. So excavated cavities are made by woodpeckers or there can be cavities on trees just through natural decay. Um, and these are homes for many, many different species of animals. And so we've studied uh, redhead woodpeckers um, and we go out and look at, at characteristics of, of the trees and we've done some animal behavior work. So how does urbanization influence animal behavior? Um, so we've set out sort of this uh, sort of novel object for species to interact with. And this is a, a recent graduate student, Casey Miller, who had this experimental setup where here's this bird and she had uh, motion activated cameras and this bird would go in and then it would have to figure out if the food is in the cups with the white lids or in the cups with the black lids um, and see who can adapt and, and be the most uh, versatile in, in these environments. And as a population ecologist, I like studying lots of different things and we actually have a project looking at um, rat populations across the city of Chicago. So at the level of the zip code. And so this was the famous pizza rat from a few years ago, who's not from Chicago, but there you go. All right, and that's, uh, that's kind of all I have. Um, I often have a pretty active lab with, with undergraduates. Right now, of course, is a little bit of an odd time, but I do have uh, two new graduate students in the lab, so I'm sure at some point they'll be looking for some help as well. And with that, I, I will turn it back to Dr. Martino. Thank you. Thank you. Have fabulous schnitzel for dinner tonight. I assume so, Jillian's been posting her campfire dinner. <laughs> I'm very impressed because they look better than some of what I make at home. But yeah, I eat better when I camp than I do at home. <laughs> All right, up next is Dr. Eric Nordstrom. All right, hey everyone, can you hear me all right? Yeah, okay, here we go. So uh, I'm gonna, sorry, let me share my screen here. And I will share this one. And yeah, okay, so, um, uh, hi, I'm wearing my DePaul blue. Let's go. Let's go, blue demons. Uh, so um, what I, uh, I'm Eric Nordstrom. I'm a cellular neurobiologist. Um, I've been in the bio department since 2011, I think. I'm also the director of the neuroscience program here. So um, I'll tell you what I'm kind of interested in first and then what I teach and uh, it shouldn't take too long. So basically the, the, the framework of my research interest has to do with Alzheimer's disease. So if you look in the brain of someone who has um, Alzheimer's, you'll find uh, deposits that start in areas of the brain that are um, very important for memory. So you're probably already aware that Alzheimer's is a, um, it's a dementia that, that seriously affects a person's memory. Um, and you see that pathology forming there early and then spreading throughout the brain. And if you kind of take a piece of brain tissue and look close up and look at the difference between an Alzheimer's brain and a normal brain, um, you see a couple of things, some obligate pathologies, as they say. Uh, and it's not hard to see these little um, dots here that would not be in a normal brain. So these are called plaques. And um, if you look at the biochemistry, these plaques are made primarily of a little peptide called, we call it beta amyloid. Amyloid is a type of protein shape that has some characteristics and it's very sticky um, and it can disrupt a lot of things uh, in the cell. So where does that little peptide come from? Well, it comes from a larger protein called the amyloid precursor protein. And um, so that's what I study, not really the peptide or the pathology, but um, 
the, the precursor protein. And uh, my questions are really, um, you know, who does it hang out with in the cell? Um, why, why does it generate more or less of this particular peptide? Because generating that peptide is, is not the only fate for this particular protein. It has a few um, uh, metabolic pathways. And so, um, you know, I'm really interested in, in how this protein is processed, a full review of its cellular biology, essentially. Um, and to, to answer that question, I kind of just use whatever technique needs to be used to answer that. So uh, um, it's a lot of biochemistry in my lab, um, cell biology, and I also um, use proteomics when I have questions um, that need to use that to, to answer them. Um, so as you can imagine, the pandemic has not been kind to the, the kind of lab where if I'm training a student, I kind of have to stand two feet from them for hours on end. And uh, um, so it's been a little devastating to my productivity, but, um, but we'll get through this people and uh, someday we'll, we'll be back on track. So uh, um, yeah, so I'll be hopefully ramping up again in the winter. We'll see how things go. And um, if, if you have had cell biology and biochemistry, um, then you might be a good candidate for my lab. Feel free to reach out. Uh, and if you do reach out, uh, please be patient waiting for me to email back. <laughs> but I will get back to you. So uh, in terms of what I teach, um, I'm a neurobiologist. So I teach, um, you'll run into me in classes like Cell Neuro um, and Human Anatomy, if you take that. that that's a fun one. Um, I also uh, teach less frequently, so I've listed these in frequency, order of frequency, uh, Gen Bio um, and uh, a non-majors class called Brain and Behavior. Um, and I also teach in the neuroscience program, uh, Intro to Neuroscience. And yeah, that's it. That's me in a nutshell. I, feel free to contact me with any other questions you might have. I, I'm, free to, I'm happy to talk about, uh, I need human contact. <laughs> I'm, happy, I'm happy to talk about anything, any questions that you might have. So, all right, well, thanks so much. Thank you. And I think you get the award for the best quarantine beard so far. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I've been doing uh, while not, I've been reading papers, working on manuscripts and growing my beard. <laughs> all right, next up is Professor Ann Chair of the department, Dr. Margaret Silliker. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Margaret Silliker. I'm gonna try and share my screen here and Can everybody see that? I, I can no longer see you, so I'm going to assume so. So um, I'm Margaret Silliker, and I teach molecular biology. I teach uh, communicating science, which is a course for graduate students, and uh, intro to STEM mentoring, which is a um, course for uh, peer mentors who are undergraduates. And hope I can induce some of you to take that and participate in our peer mentoring program. Um, so uh, what I got pictured here is a uh, one representation of the tree of life. And I'm always amazed uh, as a biologist um, with the diversity of life and also that we can identify many um, uh, unifying characteristics of life. Uh, let me uh, orient you on the tree here. So we're on this branch, we're eukaryotes, nucleated cells. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer on this to the apex of the tree of life, which, as you can see, um, um, is uh, represented by slime molds. So um, quiz question number one, what organism do you guess that I research? Um, that's right, slime molds, uh, particularly um, this slime mold, Dimium iridis, and this will show you um, several aspects of its life cycle. Uh, it has a haploid stage and a diploid stage, and uh, these critters can mate. And the most interesting stage is the plasmodial stage, which is basically a giant multinucleated amoebal cell that can crawl over and through things. Um, and it can be as big as a uh, a saucer or uh, a dinner plate or a manhole cover, or even larger than that. Um, so um, uh, 
some of the things that I've studied um, focusing on this organism is mitochondrial inheritance in this organism. In higher organisms, the mom's the one who donates the mitochondria, which are obviously energy generating um, organelles. Um, but in this organism, their males and females aren't anatomically differentiated. And in fact, there are 13 sexes. Um, so my question was who, who gets to, to contribute the mitochondria? And then um, probing more closely, looking at the mitochondrial genome, um, in this organism, it's five times larger than the human mitochondrial genome. So um, we're trying to figure out what some of those additional genes are doing there, why, why they're uh, um, present. Um, and then looking a little bit more closely at the mitochondrial DNA, when you look for typical mitochondrial genes involved in respiration, and you try and translate the um, DNA into a protein that's represented here, it's just littered with stop codons. So this organism does something that is present in other organisms, but it does it in a very complicated and unique way when the information encoded in the DNA is um, copied into RNA in order to make a protein, all of the mistakes get edited out. Um, so we're trying to figure out what that pattern is and what the signals are for um, taking a, a, a dirty gene and cleaning it up and making it functional. So the uh, methods that I use draw from the fields of molecular um, and cell biology and microbiology. And um, I want to welcome you all to fall quarter, to the department if you're new. It's a great department. The people, as you probably have figured out by now in this part of the presentation, are, are the best in the university. So with that, I will turn it back to Dr. Martineau, who um, appreciate being the MC for this. Okay. Well, I'm actually going to hand over my MC duties now because you've heard enough of me talking until I introduce myself, at least, um, to one of our other seminar committee members, Rima Bakrauskas, and she's going to introduce some of the other faculty, staff, and students that also are very critical to supporting the teaching and research in our department. All right. Hello, everybody. I don't know if you've been playing at home, but I almost have Zoom bingo. I'm just waiting for one of my dogs to start barking, which I'm sure they will. So if I hurriedly go to mute, that's probably why. Um, or for some reason, ever since I wrote the sneeze thing, I feel like I have to sneeze, but we'll see how far I can get through. Okay. So who am I? Kind of what do I do? Where do I teach? Um, one of the main courses that I'm usually teaching is Bio 193, and I'm doing that this quarter on the off sequence, yay. Um, I have taught uh, Bio 201, which was anatomy uh, for Dr. Nordstrom when he was on leave. Um, I will be in it in the spring quarter in their labs. Um, I have also taught in the past a junior year experiential learning course, um, and I also have taught a non-majors class. I usually run around the labs um, doing uh, cell bio as well as genetics labs coordinating. Uh, so that's usually kind of everyone's favorite bit is running around in labs and unfortunately we don't have that so we're all missing it. But uh, we will eventually get back to normal soon. Um, my interests, usually I have done research for my master's. Um, I did research in aquatic physiology and stress tolerance. Um, and right now I don't do any research, but I still kind of keep up with stress tolerance by doing triathlons and stressing my body. And um, if you're ever interested about talking about triathlons or physiology or pretty much anything, I'm pretty accessible and I love to talk to people and I miss people too. So with that, little short bit, I'd like to introduce one of our next teaching faculty and also lab uh, coordinator, uh, Claire uh, should be able to be here, I think. Where is she? Claire, you here? Yes, here I am. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Thanks, Rima. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that now. <laughs> All right, so um, like Rima said, I'm one of the lab coordinators and uh, lab instructors here at DePaul. Um, so I've been a lab coordinator at DePaul since 2012. Um, and before that, I actually received my master's degree um, at DePaul as well. Um, so the courses I'm involved with, um, so I'm a, I'm a lab instructor for Bio 191 in the fall. Um, 
And I also coordinate the off-sequence general biology 191 um, and 192 labs during both winter and spring quarter. So um, my research focus um, has been in uh, species diversity and um, ecosystem restoration. So um, more specifically, I looked at, um, this was for my master's, I looked at how microarthropod diversity um, is influenced by um, above ground plant diversity. And, um, I was also lucky enough recently to do a little work in Dr. Dean's lab um, for a time and I learned a little bit about some plant biochemistry too. Um, and then I also wanted to share a photo of my family. So um, that's my husband there and two-year-old daughter, Ariana. So as you can imagine, those two keep, keep me focused. Um, and my, my daughter is repeating absolutely everything I say right now. So it's pretty, pretty fun when, um, when I talk science around here to hear her little mouth say fermentation and macromolecules and, and all that good stuff. Um, then I also shared a picture of my cats. So Remy and Logan. Um, if you're in one of my labs this quarter, you may likely see Remy. He loves to come on Zoom with me. So, um, so yeah, I, I hope I get it, get the chance to work with um, some of you in a biology lab soon when we're all back to normal. And if, if not um, in lab, um, at least I'll see you virtually soon. Okay, so I'll send things back to, to Rima. All right, thank you. Um, I wanted to take a second to make sure everyone was aware of who the awesome bio staff advisor is. She unfortunately had to go on vacation this week, sigh, um, but lucky her. Uh, so her name is Jamie Engel and she does a fabulous job. She's very reachable. So if you have questions about classes, what you should be signing up for, or other things like that, make sure you're reaching out to Jamie. Um, she's really great about getting back to people and is also extremely nice. Uh, a couple other teaching staff that really help our department run. Uh, they teach a ton for us and they're awesome, but couldn't be here today. But just in case you run into them eventually, I wanted to make sure you guys were aware of just their names. Um, so we have Dr. Terry Fitzpatrick and Dr. Hudson, Dr. Pamet. Uh, Dr. Richardson, as well as Soderstrom. So they teach a variety of classes for us at Paul um, and are incredibly, incredibly important to our department as well. Uh, so next up, we do have one of our faculty here, Dr. Martino. Back to me. All right. So as Rima said, I'm one of the teaching faculty for the department, so I don't have a research program at DePaul, but I do have a background in research, and I've studied everything from the cell cycle regulation in yeast to apoptosis in animal cells to brain development in mice to eye development in flies to the roles of growth factor signaling in cell cell adhesion in breast cancer. So not surprisingly, uh, because I'm not really able to settle on one subject, I got this job to teach general biology. Uh, so I've taught uh, lecture in 191 before. Right now I'm teaching uh, lecture in 193. And I also coordinate the labs for all three of those courses. So those of you who are in 191 at the moment know um, I'm organizing the labs. And, and because I couldn't stay out of the lab, brought some lab home with me. And I've been posting some very comedic videos of me doing science experiments in my kitchen for your entertainment. Um, in addition to general biology, I also teach uh, SWK course for non-majors called the Science and Art of Vision, which I'll be teaching in the winter. Uh, I've also taught Intro to Biology with Lab for non-majors and occasionally teach an exercise physiology course that's an upper level course for majors and grad students. And then you can also see um, my inspiration for that is I'm an athlete like Rima. Um, not much of a swimmer, so I've never done a triathlon, but running is, is my favorite. Um, and then off to the left you'll see my current science experiment outside of the lab. Uh, I'm the mother of twins and I've pretty much convinced myself that neither nature or nurture is in charge of who you become because even though they have so much genetically in common and the same parents and household, they are polar opposites of one another and they're both wonderful. So you'll hear me talk about them a lot too. Um, I just also wanted to make a shameless plug for some other upcoming seminars. These are also going to be on Zoom. Um, so we've got 
Dr. Landl from physics, who's going to be coming in October um, to speak not just about what his research is, but also his involvement with the maker community at DePaul in response to the pandemic and some of the great work that they did to support um, healthcare workers and frontline workers. Um, and then in November, we've got Dr. Margaret Bell, who you've already met today, and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the research that's relevant to um, her um, biology of poverty course. Okay, and then there also will be additional dates in winter and spring quarter. We haven't nailed those specific dates down yet, but we've already got some speakers lined up for a number of those months. So we hope to see you back in those seminars as well. All right, thank you very much. Uh, to keep things moving along, because I know it's been a little while and everyone needs to get up and move around some soon. Um, a person that we really could not do without is uh, Damian Rodriguez. He's our office administrator extraordinaire. We wanted to make sure he had a chance to say hi because he's sort of our face of department within the office. So Damian, would you like to say hi? Um, this is not Damien. This is Margaret again. Um, but oh. Damien had to go pick up a package at the mailroom for um, that was perishable for one of our faculty. So I told you um, we couldn't do without him. We couldn't do without him. And <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry. So he he's he's absolutely fabulous. So if you're ever around um, and in person, oh yeah, go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, and is Tim Sosa here? Yes. Oh, were you getting to that? Okay. Yep. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, sorry. Um, the uh, another person who actually was here at the start. Um, but unfortunately had to leave to go pick up her kids and they have very strict rules with the pandemic going on was Dr. Megan Scrementi. She's part of our seminar committee. She also is teaching Gen Bio 191 right now. So a lot of you might be some of her students because she did try to encourage everyone to come. She wanted to make sure she said hi. And then it looks like Damien actually just popped back on. Damien, you missed your intro. So if you're around, can you hear me? Do you want to pop in and say hi? So I saw his name on the list. Even He's when there, we see him. Okay. But I don't know, maybe he just left, he left it logged in while he ran out to get the package. <laughs> no, he's, he, all right, well, he's there, he's there. Well, we'll get to him again in a second. Um, I, I can see, it. he's got a very fun Chicago mask on right now, I love it. All right, uh, um, next up is Dr. Sosa. He is one of our adjuncts. Um, he just wanted to say a quick hi because his uh, connection was kind of going in and out, but we'll just give him a second just to kind of introduce himself really quickly. Okay, I'm gonna see if this works. Um, all right. Okay, so, um, so this is me uh, with one of my illustrations. This is my first love is just drawing pictures of nature. This is kind of what got me into biology. Uh, so that's a, a fish skull that I dissected when I was doing grad work in Columbia. Um, and then on the upper right is a, is a penstemon I photographed in the Grand Canyon. And the lower left is a, is a tetra I captured in Guatemala. And on the lower right is a, it's a salamander from upstate New York. So I, I'm just really into organisms. I'm really into um, the evolution and ecology of organisms. I don't have a research program at DePaul. I'm just a, uh, I'm, I'm purely teaching. Although I do still have, a, because I did my PhD here in Chicago, I have a, um, a broad network of collaborators here. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping at, at some point that, you know, maybe in the summers I can resume some research. Um, this is me with a garter snake uh, that I caught just a few blocks from my, my home in, in, uh, in, on the south side. Um, here at DePaul, I teach uh, Gen Bio 3. Right now I'm just doing the labs for Gen Bio 3. Um, I actually haven't done the lecture for that yet. Um, but I, I expect at one point, at some point, I'll be called on to do that. I'm doing 155, so the biology for non-majors uh, currently. Um, I'm really enjoying that class uh, just because it, it helps me. Under, um, I like getting the idea of getting an idea of where non-biologists um, get their information and with how they apprehend biology and, and the challenge of of getting them up to speed with all with the huge subject that is biology um, and how quickly it moves nowadays. 
Um, I've also done Gen Bio 2 at DePaul. I'll be doing that again in the winter with any luck. And then uh, I've done 215 ecology a couple of times. Uh, and I'll probably be doing that again in the spring, uh, again with any luck. And then uh, I've done a bunch of other courses that are pertaining to ecology, evolution, uh, just kind of natural history uh, and anatomy elsewhere. Uh, so at U Chicago and at Siena College in upstate New York. Really happy to be here. This is my second year at DePaul and um, I've just, uh, I've loved every minute of it. Uh, and I miss seeing everybody um, on campus. After this quarter, I'll have taught more um, on more remotely than in person. And uh, this, that kind of bums me out. Um, so hopefully I'll see you all again soon. All right, I hope that worked and you, I didn't cut out too much. My uh, connection has been pretty unstable today. So thanks everyone. Oh, that was great. All right, um, I think I, I see Damien now. I don't know if he can connect and just give a quick hi or not. There he is. Can you guys hear me now? All right, so yeah, I think I need my headphones. So I just want to say hi. I'm the administrator at biology. Um, I'll be on campus uh, two days a week, Tuesday and Fridays, but I'm always available uh, via cell and email. Um, it's on the bottom of my, um, uh, my signature, uh, if you ever email me. Uh, I'm here to help in any way I can. If you have a question and don't know who to talk to, reach out to me. And if I don't have the answer, I'll connect you to the correct person. Uh, have a great quarter. And I think I have actually a bio student in another class that I'm helping teach as a staff member. So it's, it's great to see you all in different uh, mediums. And uh, hopefully we're on campus soon. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, slowly wrapping up, we wanted to give a second to allow the grad students who were present to say hi, if they so wish. I think I see a few of them still around. Um, at least I thought I did. Does anybody want to quickly say hi? Just pop in. So wait, I think Simone, <laughs> she's, she's waving. You can unmute and say hi. It's okay. Uh, hello. Um, my name's Simone. Um, I'm a graduate student. I work in Dr. Bell's lab. And is there anything else I say? Uh, yeah, um, feel free to reach out to me. I, um, I also went to undergrad at DePaul. Um, I ran the Red Cross Club for many, many years. So I and was involved in lots of different clubs and stuff. So feel free and reach out if you have any like research questions or general life questions, or you just want to be friends. Let me know. Hello, it's nice to meet you. Excellent, thanks. John, you're my TA, so I'm gonna throw you under. You wanna say hi? Yeah, uh, I'm a second year graduate student. I'm working in Dr. Shimada's lab that you, you heard at the very beginning. Um, and I, I look forward to, to seeing hopefully a lot more people through, you know, research talks and seminars. But, you know, if you're interested in paleobiology, definitely join uh, Dr. Shimada's lab. He has some wonderful projects. Excellent, thank you. All right, and then last up, we do have some wonderful student organizations and student groups. I believe we had one uh, from Deep who was going to present. Uh, Alexandra, were you gonna present? Yeah, and she's also a graduate student, so this can double as her Excellent. as a graduate TA. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Alexandra. We I go by Alex. Um, I, I'm a grad, I'm a first year grad student. Um, I also did my undergrad at DePaul um, and I worked with Dr. Shimada for my undergrad, but now I'm working with Dr. Pastransky for my master's thesis. Um, and I'm also the president of DEEP. Let me share my screen with you guys so I can uh, get this going. Okay, let me, can I do present? Yes, I can. Um, okay, so DEEP stands for um, DePaul Ecology Evolution and Physiology Club. Um, and, oh, um, John, who, uh, who we just heard from, he's my, vi he's the vice, uh, the treasurer of DEEP as well. So you can contact me or John, um, if you want to know more about it after the meet after this meeting, um, but I'll just continue. So um, we're the DePaul Ecology Evolution Physiology Club. Um, we encourage and in students to uh, kind of learn about uh, science from the past, present, 
and learn about um, what's happening around them every day in their scientific community. Um, I see there's a chat. Oh, um, and then we also help with uh, academics, um, like professional opportunities with students. So um, if people want to need help getting into labs or want to um, learn about seminars or um, just like research opportunities in general or workshops were there to help you. So yeah, I like said um, we've attended seminars, um, for example, um, CARS, which is the Chicago Grad Research Symposium, and then MEEK, which is the Midwest Ecology Evolution Conference. Um, we also do research discussions. So usually if we are, um, we'll like attend like the uh, seminars at DePaul, the scientific seminars that the bio department hosts, and we'll usually meet after those and discuss what we learned, any questions that uh, we have as well. Um, we've done field trips. Uh, going, last year, uh, before COVID, we went to the Shedd Aquarium, did a tour. Um, we went to um, uh, we went to Starved Rock to go hiking. Um, oh, conferences, um, independent research. We also do um, so, like promoting uh, research for students that are interested um, in. Uh, joining a lab, lab here, and then we also guide, so academic input, connections to internships, research, and other opportunities. So we're really here to help, um, like anyone can join, um, even that's not uh, in a STEM major, but we also have things that if you're um, looking to get into research, um, we can help you with that as well. And then run workshops like, uh, um, I, my email is, I think our, we have a bunch of social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then um, here's our email above. Um, you can also email me. I, um, I'll put my email in the chat or you can email John, um, but yeah. Um, if anyone's interested, feel free to contact us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Um, I did throw in a couple of those emails from some of the awesome groups that we do have um, uh, student run groups there in the chat as well. So uh, an email for the pre dental club uh, deep. Uh, we also have a pre med pump club and then we also have a pre vet club who I believe RSVP but I'm not sure who was supposed to actually tell us about the pre vet club. Hi, um, it's me here Alyssa and Jalissa. Let me share my screen real quick. So my name is Alyssa Spires. I'm the co president of Animology. Um, I'm a senior this year and I'm ma majoring in biology and Chinese studies. My goal is to be an emergency vet in the future. Hi, my name is Jalissa Maya. I'm a senior majoring in biological sciences in the concentration of medicine and health. I am the secretary of the club and I'm also pursuing a career, want to pursue a career in the field of veterinary medicine. So we are Animology, DePaul's academic and pre-professional club focus on exploring and pursuing the different animal oriented fields of today. So we were previously known as the pre-vet club, but uh, this year our goal is to expand our focus to include members like interested in other topics surrounding wildlife conservation, research, or animal aid. Uh, we are also planning a variety of events to give members all kinds of new experiences. We, this upcoming October 6th, and on Tuesday at 6 p.m., we'll have our first online welcome event. At the bottom of the slide is a link to our member survey where you can introduce yourself and also state if you can attend for any other questions or if there are any people who would love to share their knowledge on various animal related topics, please send us an email. Oh, and also one last thing. Um, the email in chat, I'll go ahead and post the updated one, but that's our old one. This one is depaul.prevetclub at gmail.com. So I'll go ahead and put it in chat. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. 
Thank you. Sorry about that. I was just going with, with what we have, but yay, more and more information and more clubs and more inclusion. Yay, wildlife, they're important too. So um, we wanted to have uh, a great meet and greet. I think we did. Thank you so much for everybody showing up, for sharing and being involved. Um, Rima, Rima, this is Windsor. Can I interrupt just one second? No, of course. Yes, please. Just uh, because um, uh, we gave an opportunity to graduate students to introduce themselves, but there are a few first years that um, you might not be aware of. So I wanted to give, give you a second chance, maybe the first years. I see uh, Teddy Zare, John Juranek, um, Sesad was around. So if you want to introduce yourself very quickly so people just uh, know that you're, you're you know, around virtually, that'd be great. Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I'm Teddy. I'm a first year grad student and I'll be working in uh, Dr. LaMontagne's lab on that spruce project that she was talking about that was looking at the production of cones in response to uh, rising CO2 levels and warming temperatures. And yeah, if anyone ever has any questions, I also TA uh, for Dr. LaMontagne's class the topics, or not topics in ecology, Bio 215. Um, ecology. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I can put my email in the chat too. Uh, hi, I'm John Dranik. Um, I am uh, working in Dr. Shimada's lab. Um, my project is um, kind of like a census of um, the Western Interior Seaway. It's an ancient ocean um, that went through the interior of the United States. Um, right now I'm TAing for Bio 191 in Dr. Martino's and Dr. Dean's labs. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Cesar uh, Santa Fuentes. I'm joining Dr. Aguirre's lab. Uh, I'll be working with uh, fish ecology and evolution with you know, tropical fishes. I'm not currently uh, doing any TA, but hopefully I'm joining TA by winter. So good to see you all. Sophia, can I put you on the spot? You're a combined student, but <laughs> I figured you might as well introduce yourself. Yeah. Hey, I'm Sophia. I'm uh, I'm not a I'm not an undergrad. Uh, I'm a, I'm an undergrad still. I'm not a grad student, but hopefully next year I'm gonna be working with Dr. Lamontagne's. Uh, right now I'm working. Uh, well, I joined the lab uh, for the NSF. Most what I do it's like sorting seeds and all that for her lab. Uh, so yeah, I will be a grad student next year but I'm a bio major, uh, I'm part of the combined degree program. I know that not a, a lot of people know about this, so if you wanna reach out, I think it's a great opportunity to, yeah, do your master's and your undergrad. So yeah, I'm gonna put my email if you need something. Thank you. Sorry, Rima. Thanks. No, that's okay. I just, that no one really was kind of volunteering and I threw John under the bus. So I'm, I'm not happy that more people will, will speak up. There are a couple of emails running through the chat as well as a couple other groups that we do have at DePaul. Um, there is the DePaul Neuroscience Club as well as the Neuroscience Honor Society. Dr. Kozlowski was uh, nice enough to share uh, those two club names as well as their emails. Uh, Dr. Kozlowski, did you want to say anything about them? Just wanted to let you know that you don't have to be a neuroscience major to, to be involved in any of these. Actually, the president of NeuroSci right now is a biology major. Um, for neuroscience club, you can uh, join anytime for NeuroSci. There is a qualifications and application process and you do have to have a certain amount of neuroscience courses. So, um, but for neuroscience club, feel free to, to reach out. I put the emails in, um, in the chat. I think I'll turn it over to Carolyn to do any sort of final wrap up or anything like that. But I wanted to thank everyone for coming and for sharing just me personally. I get bored being alone in my kitchen. Okay. Yeah, I'll just reiterate that. Thank you very much for taking some time out of your Friday to join us and get to know everyone in the department. And as you've seen, everyone is very eager to reach out and talk biology and have some more interaction these days. So don't hesitate to reach out to any of the faculty or grad students that have come here today. If you have any questions about any of their courses, any of their research, or you just want to have a nice chat about mass seating, because who doesn't on a Friday night? So um, thank you again for coming, and I look forward to seeing you all at future seminars. <laughs>